Construction Industry Surety and Accounting Update was a live webinar that was originally produced on Thursday, February 27, 2020. For this webinar, we were joined by two presenters from McConley and Asbury, Mike Hoffner, Managing Partner, and Dan Stern, Partner, and both leaders in our firm's construction practice. We also welcomed guest presenter Gary Rispoli, Partner and Director of Surety at Construction Risk Partners. We hope you enjoy this recap, and please visit us online at macpas.com for more information about our future webinars and other events. Thanks, Melissa. Appreciate the opportunity to be here with you all. Uh, we're going to spend the next 50 minutes talking about um, a variety of topics around some new accounting pronouncements in the construction side, which I'm sure is why you all did not dial in. Uh, and the exciting part of it really, in my mind, will be a focus on some of the observations we have seen in the construction industry, both in our client base uh, and in some of the trends we've seen in the region. Uh, and Gary's going to spend some time talking about the surety market and some of what he's observed with his, his client base. Uh, my name is Mike Hoffner. Uh, I'm a partner at McConley and Asbury, oversee a number of our construction clients, as well as a few other areas of the firm. Uh, glad to be here with you today. I'm going to let Dan and Gary introduce themselves uh, when they come into their respective sections of our presentation. Uh, but again, our, our topics really are going to be focused on a, a broad look at what we're seeing in the industry. Uh, hopefully, there will be some tidbits that you can take out of that. Uh, I will encourage you to pay attention to the polling questions as they come up. Uh, those are necessary for CPE. Uh, and as you see them come up, you'll have about 30 to 45 seconds to answer those. So without further delay, I am going to turn the mic over to Dan. Uh, and Dan, if you could just uh, introduce yourself, talk a little bit about your role here at the firm in the construction practice, and then we'll jump right into the content. Thanks, Mike. Uh, like Mike said, I'm Dan Sturm. I'm a partner with McConnell and Asbury. Uh, I spend a lot of time working with uh, construction clients uh, during this time of year, especially uh, throughout the year, uh, working on so other projects other than audits and things like that. And I also spend a good bit of my time working on employee benefit plans. Uh, so what I'd like to talk through through these first couple slides, just a couple of uh, our client observations. And this is not necessarily industry-wide although they may apply industry-wide. Uh, but these are things that I just want to emphasize. These are things we've seen with our clients and talked to our clients about. So most of those clients being in the central Pennsylvania region, obviously some, some further than that region, but a lot of the, this feedback is directly from uh, this region as well. Uh, first, first point up on the screen, 2019, I think we can say consistently across the board for all of our construction-related clients, whether that be an engineering contractor or a construction contractor, subcontractors, I think the the pattern we noticed was uh, it's just a strong year across the board, uh, especially with top line growth. We saw that pretty much across the board. Uh, we're also seeing strong backlogs for both 20 and 21. Uh, not hearing a whole bunch past 2021 at this point, but I would say definitely for 2020 and 2021, definitely very strong backlogs uh, with our client base. A lot of it was the strong top line growth, uh, fairly consistent. I think the the point here is. Top lines were growing tremendously. I, I think the margins did not grow at the same pace. I mean, that was fairly consistent across our board as well. What we're seeing with that growth, uh, I, and I, these next two bullets are kind of combined. We, we, saw, we saw our clients getting a lot more selective about their projects. And the big driver behind that is making sure they had the resources to actually handle those projects. So they had to become more selective, hopefully for higher margin work. Uh, but for also to serve their customers to continue in the future as well. With the, the labor, obviously, I, I've heard this for a couple years. It's probably been going on for more than two years at this point, but more so than ever. Uh, labor continues to be one of our, our construction clients' biggest concern. It's, again, it's not getting the work. It's making sure they have the people and the resources and the right people and the right skilled labor to actually do the work. And so we're seeing our clients get more creative with the with their labor so they're they're increasing training so maybe bringing in someone a little bit less experienced than they maybe wanted uh, but they're spending a lot more money in training that that individual and getting them to the point that they need to have the labor to do the work that they're, that they're winning uh, we're also seeing clients get creative with uh, compensation not just compensation increases which obviously compensation has been driven up in this market but also get creative with benefits <clears throat> one one that i've heard the most recent about is vacation. So they're reevaluating their vacation policies. 
vacation policies that may have been in place for the past 10, 15, 20 years, they're having to reevaluate uh, just to remain competitive in this market. Uh, one, one thing I'd like to emphasize that we're hearing a little bit about, I don't see it a ton of it at this point, but obviously with the strong top line and it's full gear ahead to try to do the work and make sure you get the work done. Uh, but I think a continued emphasis on cost. So more, this is more or less a recommendation is that with this growth, uh, we've had conversations just to make sure you don't lose sight of the cost and that you're evaluating this cost just like you were if you didn't have not have that growth. So we're seeing some conversations take place about that as well. Uh, one of the, the next items, we're continuing to have conversations about R&D credits or research and development tax credits. Uh, you'd be surprised if, if you're on this call and you, you're at a construction company, you hear the word or you hear the terminology research and development and say, this doesn't apply to me. Uh, there's a good chance it does. And we're, we're seeing clients, and we have for the past few years, continue to get fairly significant tax credits uh, if you hire the right firm to come in and help you evaluate your research and development and determine if, if you qualify for those credits. Another big topic that we're seeing in almost every board meeting we attend and every management discussion we have, uh, cybersecurity continues to be one of the top concerns and making sure things are in place within the organizations to take care of those concerns. Yeah, Dan, before you move on to your next slide, there's just two on this, this slide that uh, if I can comment on briefly. Uh, one is just a reiteration of Dan's comment on the idea of focusing on costs even when times are good. I think what we see regularly uh, over the business cycles uh, is our, our clients, whether it be construction or any other industry, do an absolutely fantastic job of focusing on cost reduction strategies in times when, when things are lean. Uh, it's easy to focus on saving that 2% here and the 1% there on your cost structure. Um, but I would encourage, much like Dan said, uh, this continued focus on that. I believe virtually any economist to the industry that uh, that we listen to and speak to uh, would tell us that we have some good times ahead, but they're not going to be uh, unending. And we may be, maybe it's 12 months, maybe it's 18 months, maybe it's longer, maybe it's less, but uh, a recession is likely. Uh, and when that recession hits, those who have paid particular attention to their costs now will be the ones that uh, that do much better when things turn down. The other area, again, uh, that Dan quoted on is cybersecurity. I've been to two different cybersecurity conferences in the last seven days. Uh, it is a real and growing threat. And virtually every one of the boards of companies that we work with um, have taken some level of interest in making sure the cybersecurity risk management program in their entity is sound. Um, you can do phenomenal and fantastic work as a contractor or subcontractor, um, but it's very easy for things to crash down when someone clicks on the wrong thing or, or opens the wrong file. Uh, so just a, a high level of encouragement for those on the call uh, or on the, the webinar to really be focused on what the organization's doing and take real specific measured steps in the area of cybersecurity risk management. Uh, both great points. Thanks, Mike. I think that leads to the next slide, and I think there's a tie-in to what Mike was just talking about with cybersecurity, especially as it relates to con the construction industry. So we're also seeing continued adoption of new technology. It's slow. I, I think we hear that at some of the seminars we've been to, especially in construction. There is new technology taking place. It's probably slower to develop than some other industries. Uh, but I think back to tie that into cybersecurity with the adoption of some of this technology, this first point, the connected job sites, you have a lot more software, a lot more data being transmitted electronically at job sites. So I think the cybersecurity policies that, that you talk about within your organizations need to take that into account. So we are seeing more connected job sites. Uh, we're seeing Again, this is heavily emphasized that our clients, we, we see a lot more tracking software, a lot more sensors being installed on equipment, uh, especially on a big construction site to know where your, your equipment is, how it's being used, how long it's idling, th things like that. It's bringing a lot more data that management can use back at the home office. Uh, we're seeing a lot more accounting technologies being invested in, such as automated timekeeping. Uh, gone are the days of the time cards that somebody has to interpret back at the office. Uh, to, job time is real time at this point. Uh, so we're seeing a lot more of that. Uh, investments in software such as Viewpoint, uh, which brings all this together. Uh, we're seeing a lot more of our, our clients use drones for their inspections and surveying large areas uh, for no other reason. It's just a lot more efficient and quite honestly, in some cases, a lot more safe. Uh, we're seeing, as I pointed with the, the accounting software, we're seeing a lot more data and a lot more analytics. And I know analytics is a hot topic. 
and it's one of those those new hot terms but we're seeing a lot of a lot more of that come from these connected job sites that gives management a lot more information with all this new technology we're also seeing new new positions being filled we talked about drones and and we're seeing more drones well that requires drone operators uh, so we're seeing some new positions developed through that Thanks, Dan. So before we move over to you, Gary, to talk to us a little bit about things from your perspective, we do have our first polling question. Uh, so you will see that question on your screen. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, we'll give you about 30 to 45 seconds to make your selection. Um, so the question is, what is the most significant technology investment that you're planning for 2020 or 2021? Uh, and you'll see a few options there. The options that we've listed uh, are ones that we have seen uh, at the more the the more prevalent end, things that we've seen clients implementing or considering implementation of, a little more pervasive in the marketplace. Uh, if you have the latest, greatest, most wonderful idea that you're getting ready to implement, and it's not one of numbers one, two, or three, um, please send Dan a message about it because I would be uh, absolutely interested to learn a little bit more about what you're doing and what you're getting ready to do uh, just as we try and stay on top of things in the industry. So we'll just give you a few more minutes uh, to wrap up or a few more seconds that is. And let's go ahead and take a look at the results of the poll. So it looks like uh, about 38% of those on the call are looking at new accounting systems and software to connect job sites. Um, a small number are looking at drones and the need for drone operators. Almost half of our audience uh, is selected none of the above. So no major technology investments, uh, which um, not a bad thing. It may mean you've already done those things. Uh, it may mean that uh, we're comfortable with what we have and, and holding tight to see what happens, again, with an uncertain economy 18 to 24 months out. So with that, we're going to move on in the presentation. Um, so Dan and I have known Gary and his colleagues at Construction Risk Partners for some time now and have continued to be uh, impressed and pleased with what they bring uh, to our industry and the clarity and some of the perspective they bring. So Gary, before you get into your slides, would you mind giving us a, just a brief introduction of you and what you do? Absolutely, Mike. Mike, first and foremost, I want to thank you uh, and Dan for inviting me to participate in this webinar. Um, again, my name is Gary Raspoli. I'm a partner with Construction Risk Partners, uh, and we are a, a boutique construction-only insurance and surety firm uh, catering, as the name would imply, to the construction uh, community. Um, my, my background uh, is, is over 20 years on the surety underwriting side, worked for a, a, a national firm in positions that vary from managing the Great Lakes region, region the Mid-Atlantic, and, and ultimately overseeing uh, U.S. operations. So I, I have that perspective, and, and as you'll probably see in the slides coming up, I'm a little bit of an information junkie and, and think there's some value in it, and I'm, I'm hoping that you folks also see that value. Um, kind of dovetailing on, on what Dan had indicated and what the folks here are seeing from their clients. You know, we're, we're really in the midst, of probably uh, towards the end of it, but uh, of an unprecedented extended economic uh, cycle, which started after the Great Recession in 2009. Um, that cycle lasted 11 years, um, and the previous uh, longest cycle was from 91 to 2001, which was the, the longest cycle. Kind of interesting to note, um, and, I, and I had this information from Forbes, magazine that uh, there, there have been since 1854, there have been 33 economic cycles. And, 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 and since uh, 80, uh, 1854 to 2009, the average length of the, the uh, growth cycle was 3.2 years. And the average length of the recession cycle was, was one and a half year. And, and you, you can see, and you'll see in, in, in future slides that and I don't know, we don't know yet if it's a trend or not, but certainly these last cycles have, have gone well beyond what traditional norms um, have been observed in, in the economic cycles we've seen. Um, overall, uh, backlogs are healthy with the clients we see. And I guess I should, I should preface this by saying, um, with construction risk partners, we're, our client base is, is basically uh, east of the Mississippi uh, with primary locations in Boston, New York City, um, New Jersey, and uh, the Mid-Atlantic centered in Philadelphia. Um, but backlog levels are, are healthy. They, they're, they're, they've increased, but I would say that the, the increases are, are slowing to some degree, and we're starting to see a shift from um, robust private sector spend to uh, more public sector spend. Um, 
margins have risen slowly, and I, I think uh, commentary on this this long economic cycle compared to others is is um, in the beginning of the cycle, it was almost a marginless uh, recovery and that we really didn't see an uptick. And I think that's because uh, lots of firms had uh, backlogs that uh, were deplete and, 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 and they needed work. And so, you know, the, the law of supply and demand kind of uh, dictated it. And slowly but surely, though, we have seen an increase in margin, which is uh, obviously a good thing. Um, most all of our, our firms that we see are, are profitable. We are seeing some red ink, and I would say that generally um, that's been attributable more to the um, the highway heavy sector where where maybe there hasn't been quite as much spend, even, although we've certainly heard a lot of talk about uh, spend, um, and, and, and the competition competition remains fierce as as to echo again what the folks at McConley and Asbury are seeing, the, the, the competition for, for skilled labor and project management is absolutely fierce. Uh, this this slide uh, demonstrates uh, from 1997 through to, through to 2018. The 19 numbers are not out yet, but there's projections in this slide. Um, the construction spend in both residential, non-residential, and non-building structure. Just to, to clarify, so non-residential would be would be vertical building. Uh, residential would be homes and multifamily, and then the non-building sector would be highway heavy civil type construction. Um, the, the green line represents the the residential, and the uh, the black line represents the non-building structure. Um, and and as you can see, we, we can see that there's the, the uh, hopefully it comes through in the slides. The gray bars represent the uh, the last two cycles of recessions, um, and you can see the dips in the in the economy. Um, and the uh, the projections once again look look pretty good in, in coming out of it. Um, and, and the uh, the, there's continued growth, but the, the growth, I think most everyone's predicting is, is going to be slower um, from that slide. This, this slide simply breaks it down. It's, it's the same data, but, but only numerical. Um, and, and I th also thought it might be so, the, to some advantage to look at Mid-Atlantic and South Atlantic. The way these are broken out by uh, the U.S. Census Department is Mid-Atlantic, they define as Pennsylvania and New York. Uh, and as you can see, uh, the numbers there, the, the, the prediction is that there's going to be, it's going to be flat relative to construction spend in that region. And South Atlantic um, is, is Maryland, D.C., Virginia, and the Carolinas. Um, and and there, that, that matches the U.S. growth of 1.4% from 2019 to, to uh, 2020. And once again, these are projections. The, despite, despite some of the distress, um, most everyone believes that we're, we're probably looking at another 12 to 18 months of incre of, of activity, uh, either flat or, or growth rate. So we're still expecting some some strong um, strong results. Um, in terms of the stretches, touching that quickly, um, I think that you know it's 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 kind of what you read in the newspapers, right? It's, it's, we have the geo geopolitical unrest that could could uh, impact our economy in terms of. Uh, Folks like the Russians in, in North Korea, China, the Middle East, and the, the, the unrest there, um, and then we have, of course, the, the the political turmoil that we face in our country. And and really, you know, aside from all the the, the banter and back and forth and the discourse, um, what it really does, especially when it when it comes to to, to construction, public spending budgets, it, it, we nothing gets done anymore. And, and this this certainly can represent an issue. And in, in cycles past, when when we'd hit recessionary periods, um, the government would spend more money in terms of construction, and it would soften the blow. And um, you know, the skeptic in me is worried that th that may not be the case the next in the next downturn. So I guess we'll we'll see about that. Um, from a positive perspective, interest rate late rates remain low. Um, spurring, uh, you know, private spend growth and state revenues are up um, due to the strong economy and there's there's more money in the coffers or spends like schools, roads and transit. Um, just uh, the 2018, the 2019 numbers aren't out, but just taking Pennsylvania, for example, uh, state revenues are up 5 percent and in Maryland uh, budgets are up 18 percent. So, like I said, strong growth there. Um, in terms, in terms of looking out, uh, the business, as I said before, the business conditions remain positive. Um, 
the, this slide is the architectural billing index, which is a leading indicator and basically is a survey of architects to determine what they have on the books and, and the spend with the understanding that what, once it comes out of, of architect, it's going to be put uh, put to the construction uh, cycle. Um, and and the, the, the middle line is uh, 50 represents a flat spend. And as you can see, the, the, the for the year 2019, it's really been kind of a mixed bag. We've been up and down, but the, the last few months, uh, the cycle has been pretty strong. Um, once again, which would lead us to believe that there, there's going to be a continued spend for, for 2020. And I think anecdotally, in talking to our clients, most everyone uh, sees a good 2020, and, and we're, we're starting to see backlog added for 2021. So once again, pretty positive stuff. You know, I think one interesting thing back to Couple a couple of slides back, Gary, that you mentioned, and I, as I look at your graph and and residential, the projections for residential looking out to 2023 ties into. We recently heard an economist speak, and I think a lot of that is honestly going to be driven from what what I've heard on millennials uh, moving out of cities, looking for single single family homes. Uh, so I think once we get through what we expect to be this, I'll call it a slowdown, maybe not even a recession at this point there's going to be a lot of millennials looking for homes. And quite honestly, I've already heard inventories low. So it seems like that would be part of the, the growth. I don't know if you've heard something similar or other, other, but I, that's one definite pattern that I've heard. There, there, you know, there's, 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 it's a mixed bag. Uh, the economists don't seem to, I think that ultimately the, I think economists agree that at sooner or later uh, this, this apparent shift, certainly in the, in the last five to seven years, we've seen a tremendous growth in multifamily apartment building. Um, but I don't, I don't know that that is a, 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 a transformative change in the economy or a change in the buying habits. I think there's still, um, there, people still see a value in investing in a property and, and, and owning their own home. I just think that um, there's probably a lot of different dynamics, including student debt that have impacted or deferred uh, that. So I, I but I, I would agree with you, Dan, you would think that that, that spend is coming. I did not expect us to get into a conversation about millennials and their buying <laughs> habits during today's webinar, but thank you guys. It was very, it was very relevant. <laughs> um, so we're going to move into our second polling question here before we continue our discussion. Uh, and this one really should be a, a pretty simple one for you to answer. Uh, what type of revenue growth did you experience in 2019? As we're in a phase where um, the majority, certainly not all, but the majority of the companies we work with are calendar year ends. And so we're in that phase of we just closed our books. We may be going through uh, audit or review and trying to close things out for the bank, uh, but we have a good sense. So please take a moment uh, and answer what your thoughts are on what kind of revenue growth you experienced in 19. Uh, and then we'll, in just a, a minute here, take a look at what the feedback from our audience is uh, relative to what they've seen. While that's going on, I would also remind you that you have an opportunity to pose a question to our panel here. Uh, any question that would be exceedingly difficult, we're going to ask Gary to answer. Anything that's a softball and easy, I'll take, and all the ones in between, we'll pass over to Dan for answer. Uh, so, but please take a minute and log those questions. And as we have time at the end of our webinar today, we will answer those. And if we do run out of time before the end of the webinar, uh, we will address you on an individual basis uh, based on who posed the question. We'll get you our thoughts back uh, in short order. So with that, let's take a look at what the results of our polling question are. Uh, looks like uh, almost 70% of our, our respondents said they had steady growth consistent with the previous two to three years. 15% had a record year, so congratulations to you. 3% uh, did not experience any growth and about 5% or sorry, 12% experienced um, a re reasonably flat year. Uh, and then about 5% of our respondents did experience a decline. Uh, and I would be curious, again, we're not digging into particular sector data, but I would be curious if there's any uh, themes amongst the, the sectors in which the 5% the that responded with that answer would play. So uh, thank you for that. So we're gonna continue on in our agenda and the next session is one, or the next section of our, our webinar is one that I know Dan in particular has been absolutely excited about presenting. Gary is chomping at the bit to listen to what Dan has to say. And I'm sure each and every one of you out there uh, is, is thrilled with one of the most significant changes, not to, not to our industry as a whole, 
but to the financial statements of our industry. So we, we still do things uh, from a how we, we serve our customers, how we, how we build things, how we put things into service. Uh, all that's the same, but we went ahead and changed the rules on how we account for it. So our next few slides are just some lessons learned. So Dan's going to walk us through that. So I will turn it over to you, Dan. No, that was quite an intro. Thanks, Mike. Everybody <laughs> should be excited for these next few slides after that. I tried really hard to get Gary to take these, but uh, he, he punted it right back to me. Unhappening. Yeah, right? <laughs> so with that being said, it, these next few slides are not intended to, to teach you how to implement ASC 606. We, we've, we've had numerous webinars and trainings on that over the past few years. That is not the intent. This is now that we've been through not quite a full cycle of implementation with most of our clients yet, but we're getting close to the, that full cycle. Uh, we wanted to share some observations. And I want these are observations, again, similar to what we're seeing in their businesses. These are, these are our, our observations from what we've seen. And I would say these are highly geared towards private entities. So it's not necessarily the public entities and the large, massive construction companies may feel completely different. Uh, but from a private entity standpoint, that businesses operate substantially in one, one segment and they don't do a whole lot, I, I think this is where this applies the most. But again, we're seeing it across the board. Overall, as this first point mentioned, we're not seeing anywhere close to the impact uh, from ASC 606 that we, we maybe thought three years ago. And I just talked to, to Gary about this yesterday. We just, we just didn't see the impact. And so th when I say that it's not changing revenue in the current year drastically, we're not seeing adjustments to retained earnings to, to fix things from the past, uh, just didn't have an overall impact. What we did see is a big introduction of new terminology. And this is not all encompassing. This is not every new term that's been introduced, but these are some of the, the more key terms that we're seeing that impact the financial statements. First being performance obligations. Uh, we have variable consideration, uninstalled materials, and then contract modifications. And again, even if these aren't new terms, there's been a lot of emphasis placed in these areas. And the one probably biggest thing that I continue to learn every day with 606 is that it allows for a ton of judgment. Uh, so within your organizations, while you may do something you're exactly the same as your competitor does, your judgment and looking at how you evaluate your contract may be completely different. And so you'll see that these, what I capitalized here three times over, you'll see this in every part that I'm gonna discuss with 606. Just document, document, document. Just make sure that you are documenting your rationales, your judgments, the thoughts you have at, at, to reach your conclusions. It's hard for, especially as an auditor, which we spend a lot of our days doing, to question judgment, especially if you have a reason and rationalization for a sound judgment. From a presentation perspective, this is probably the, the most significant change. Now, presentation not to be confused with changes in numbers, but really just maybe reclassifications uh, and changes in terminology. So we've been introduced to topic or to to names such as contract assets and liabilities, uh, reclassification of billings, billing and costs in excess of earnings, retainage balances and deferred revenue. That's what we're seeing the most of. And again, that's most common to our clients. We There may be other changes out there, but I would say that's the most prevalent across the board. Disclosure, disclosure changes, obviously we're seeing uh, revised revenue recognition policies. So that revenue recognition policy that you had that was probably about a paragraph long. I think what I'm seeing now is probably averaging a page, if not a page and a half. So you did add some volume to your financial statements. Uh, we're disclosing uh, the adoption of 606 and what that meant to your organization. Uh, there's also new disclosures to describe what your contract assets and liabilities were. And probably the, I wouldn't say the most significant, but probably the biggest change is this disaggregation of revenue. Uh, so that's just going in and making sure you're disaggregating your revenue in an appropriate manner. Dan, in your humble and professional opinion, and, and Gary, you can feel free to weigh in on this if, if you'd like. With what you've seen, do you believe that these additional disclosures have actually added value to the users of the financial statements? I don't. Um, I, I, From my personal opinion, I don't think it's added a lot of value to the users. I think in one of the slides, I'll point out some unintended benefits of the adoption but I don't know if I would say value from the disclosure specifically. And I, I would just, I would agree. And I would say I, from what I, and obviously you folks are the expert, but as a user of the financial statement, it doesn't seem like 606 really was something that, that was, that should have been, a, that really addressed anything on the construction, uh, contract, uh, uh, construction company's balance sheet. 
in, in terms of disclosure. It really, you know, it, it seemed like it, what we had in place worked. And I think I think maybe it's we're, we're seeing that to be the case because there's so the, the changes are so immaterial in terms of the work you folks are doing. No, I, I, I would agree with that 100 percent. Uh, what we are seeing, as we expected, most entities selected the modified retrospective approach. I don't know that I've had one client want to restate both years that are presented or if they present more than two years that they've wanted to go back and restate those prior periods. Uh, what that means is some of the disclosures are single period only. Uh, so we're seeing that. Uh, as I just mentioned, we're seeing really minimal impact, if any, on retained earnings. Quite honestly, the, the impacts I've seen have been so small that there's been no adjustments to retained earnings at this point. Uh, one of the things, and we, we had this discussion this morning as well, is if, if I look back about three years ago, I may have encouraged a couple of my clients to consider looking at an alternative framework uh, just to, with the training and the complexity that we thought 606 would bring uh, to consider a framework like the, the framework for small, medium-sized entities, uh, basically to avoid 606 and other upcoming standards like leases. And as I look back, I, I'm actually glad none of my clients went that route. I mean, I think it's still an appropriate method, um, but I think as we got further into 606, <laughs> we didn't see the need and the complexity with a lot of our clients to drive changing your financial statements and trying to get approval from your banks. Next point on here is, and again, I don't want to suggest that 606 is not complex, um, but I would say probably the biggest thing we've learned is don't overcomplicate it, meaning have a lot of discussions, but know what's important to your organization. And with that being said, like things like performance obligations, variable consideration, it's easy to get hung up in a two-hour session talking about some of these items and going through training and getting hung up in the details it may not apply to your organization. So that's what I mean by don't overcomplicate it. Realize what's important to your organization and focus on those points. And I, I think, Dan, to that point, we've had a lot of conversations with clients in this market where we can chase down the rabbit trails and really get into the weeds on a particular accounting decision or discussion that technically under 606 would be right and require a change in how we approach things. But But we have to just just put the brakes on. And I think I would encourage you all to put the brakes on and say, wait a minute, does this really impact things in any measure of a material way? And, and considering our relationship with non-public entities, entities that are doing things 99% in accordance with the standard, that final 1%, the amount of energy and effort that it takes to be 100% compliant with some of these nuances of 606, it truly is overcomplicating it for absolutely zero benefits. I echo 100%, Dan, your your thought to let's, don't overthink it. Let's let's get it as right as it needs to be for the users of our financials, and we'll slow down and, and move on. Yeah, and if you find yourself as a client or anyone on this call kind of going down one of those paths where you just think you're, things are getting way too complicated, uh, give us a call. We'll, we've seen enough of, this, uh, enough of this at this point to where I think we can probably hopefully not have you go down all the way down that path. That being said, think to focus on some of these key terms and what we're seeing, uh, performance obligations, I, I think the, the biggest point I would recommend is just make sure there's consistency across your contracts. Uh, so whatever judgments and decisions you make with your performance obligations, whether you have one or whether you have four, there's probably enough consistency in your jobs to where your how you account for those jobs should be consistent across the board. So pick an approach, um, as we as I mentioned again, document your rationales and judgments. And it's it's really hard, and I speak on behalf of an auditor, for me to come in and question what your judgment was to come to that conclusion. Same with variable consideration. This mostly comes up when we have things like awards and incentive payments. Uh, point here is do not default to zero. Um, if you have variable consideration or you have an incentive to complete a contract early or some kind of award at the end of the contract, you want to try to pick up some kind of value in your in your revenue and your contract value of the amount that it doesn't have a probability of being reversed. And maybe you just don't know. Maybe there is no probability it won't be reversed, so you don't record it. But again, it gets back to just understanding what your contracts look like and the outcomes. And the other side of that equation, Dan, is is keeping in mind the liquidated damages component. And in 
consistent application. We've seen clients uh, take a liquidated damage as an additional accrual where the theory is that's really factored into your revenue from day one and part of your revenue analysis. So don't don't overlook that aspect of it as well. No, absolutely. Good point. Uh, another big topic that I think we've had a lot of conversations on with our clients is uninstalled materials. And I think one of the things we've learned through conversations with our clients is depending on the size of your entity and depending on how many jobs you have open at your end, I, I think what we're seeing is a good practice that you may not need to overhaul your process to look for uninstalled materials throughout the year. It might be a case where you just have a couple jobs open at your end to really focus on what jobs are open and do you have any uninstalled materials you need to evaluate. That way you don't get in this process of spending hours throughout the year trying to figure out if you have uninstalled materials to account for on a month-to-month -month basis. But most of the emphasis seems to be on those year-end financial statements to take a deeper dive and see if there's anything there. Another item that's come up quite a bit is uh, unapproved contract modifications or change orders. I Biggest point here I'll emphasize is make sure your project manager, ma project managers are involved in these discussions, especially back to this whole year-end approach, making sure your project managers are keeping accounting aware of, hey, we have this change order that's it's basically unapproved, as it says. It may be oral, may be written, maybe just a customary practice. But again, it's another good opportunity with these change orders not to necessarily look throughout the year because they may not provide a lot of value, but to really understand if we have any unapproved change orders at year end and make sure they're being accounted for properly. Last topic up here is uh, waste and rework. And we are seeing more discussions around this as well. And that <clears throat> really is just making sure you're not including waste and rework in your percentage completion. And the, the whole concept behind that is the, the waste and rework is not basically moving the, the quote-unquote performance obligation along, so it should not be driving revenue any sooner. So in a, a best practice would be to pull those costs out of the contract accounting and account for those separately so it's not driving any revenue. <coughs> As I've mentioned, the uh, biggest thing we've learned, ASC 606, it just involves judgment. It's not black and white. Uh, so. Well, I, I think there's days where I would love just the black and white. The accountant in me would love just give me, give me the strict number and the strict answer. There's a lot of judgment involved in this, and I, that's the good part. I think you can continue to run your business the way you run, want to run it, and account for things how you may have done them in the past. You got to use your judgment and make sure you're getting those into your processes. As I talked about earlier, there's a couple unintended benefits that I've really seen come out of this. It has nothing to do with the numbers. Has nothing to do with disclosures but I've seen a lot more collaboration that our clients bring, not just accounting, but bring their sales and operations folks into one room and talk about everything they do. Uh, so that is probably the biggest benefit I've seen. They're being forced to have discussions to, about the operations of the business and how it affects the financial statements that may not have ever been had without 606. I'm also seeing more consistency across contracts and agreements. So again, you have an entity that has multi, basically the same type of contract over and over again. If you pull that contract or some kind of agreement, 10 out of 10 times, it might look a little bit different. So under 606, I'm seeing organizations bring a lot more consistency with their documentation. Same with the processes. It's really just taking a fresh look at processes that have been in place for years and years and revising those to adjust to a more fresh approach, even if it had no impact on 606 at all. It's forcing them to look at processes and an overall better understanding of the processes. I've heard accounting folks say, Oh, if I didn't have those meetings and collaborate with sales and operations, I actually, I learned something through this process. I didn't realize we did things this way. So it allows people to collaborate and talk a little bit more. Thanks, Dan. With, with that, we're going to jump right into the next polling question, our third and final of the required polling questions, uh, which asks simply, overall, how did you feel about your adoption of ASC 606? I think Dan's given us a pretty clear overview of how he felt about it, uh, but we're curious as to those on the receiving end of this webinar. Was it easier than you thought? Was it extremely challenging and required a significant amount of effort and change? Um, Number three, I, if there's a few folks out there who maybe have not adopted yet based on their year end or a, a potential departure. Uh, and then finally, those who might have said, forget it, we're not doing this, we move to a different framework. Uh, and while you're answering that, 
Um, I would say for those of you in our audience, which I'm sure is the majority of our audience, who found the last 10 to 15 minutes to be truly invigorating and exciting, uh, I would point you to archived webinars that uh, exist that Dan has done, or I would offer up a one-on-one -on -one training session with Dan because he is exceedingly passionate about this particular topic and I'm sure would love to uh, bend your ear a little bit more about the adoption of 606 and the things that we found through that. So with that, let's take a look at the results of our poll. Um, Half of you, fully 50% of you said it wasn't bad, it was easier than we thought, which is good. That's consistent with, uh, with what Dan saw. 8% uh, of you said it was challenging and required a significant amount of process changes. So certainly a small minority of those listening, uh, but for those, uh, I'm assuming probably some unique circumstances, whether it be an industry item, a software item, uh, but certainly uh, glad that you worked through those. 28% of our respondents have not adopted yet, uh, which I won't care to wax poetic on that. I'm not sure exactly reasons for that, other than I know some are taking a gap departure and moving on because there's there's no benefit to the pain involved. Uh, and then finally, 15% of you have said uh, no impact. We're moving to a reporting framework that doesn't require us to do this. So thank you for that. Very interesting um, results. With that, we're going to move very, very quickly through a couple of slides on other things to be aware of from an accounting pronouncements. But uh, Dan, I'm going to ask you to move extremely quickly through this so you can get out of the way because we would like to close out the webinar uh, with a good solid amount of time from Gary on what we're seeing in the surety industry. Since you said quickly three different times within about two sentences, I, I guess I should move quickly through this. Uh, so I'm not going to go in detail on any of these. Uh, what, what I really wanted to highlight here, and again, this is not every new accounting pronouncement that came out. These are things that, that could apply and have applied to across our client base more consistently. Obviously, we've just talked about revenue. Uh, another one that's applicable for this year's statement of cash flows doesn't change a whole lot. Uh, just changes, it clarifies some classification. Uh, looking forward to head after 2019, the big one on this list is leases. Uh, we also have another one uh, for testing goodwill impairment, simplifies that process. Uh, we look at internal use software. Uh, so as clients out there are adopting new software, whether it be cloud-based technology or other technologies, just be aware that there are new ASUs out there to tell you how to account for those costs. Uh, on the next slide, uh, the last one we have up here is uh, consolidation targeted improvements. Uh, for those of you that have got stuck in the VIE consolidation the past few years, uh, the FASB has expanded that to extend beyond leases, which we're all very happy about. Uh, so it should take away maybe some kind of consolidations you don't want. Uh, a couple resources out there you want to be aware of, FASB.org. And my favorite resource recently is the AICPA Center for Plain English Accounting. If you have not joined that or have heard of it, I'd highly encourage of it. Encourage it. It's, it's a great resource and breaks down some of these more technical topics uh, to private entities. And with that, I will shift it over to Gary. Thanks, Dan. I appreciate it. Boy, but considering the fact that when it seems like we've been talking about revenue rec for, for years and, and scared the heck out of those who are, who thought maybe we need to be retrained on how to analyze a financial statement, I'm, I'm glad it's 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 kind of turned out like Y2K, uh, somewhat of a non-event. <laughs> so uh, I'm thankful for that. Thank you. Um, in, in terms of the surety industry, no real surprise. The surety industry, it really is symbiotic to the to the economy, right? And so it stands a reason that uh, the surety industry is enjoying uh, its its longest profitable cycle in, in history, which is, uh, um, and I'll get into this in a little while, but basically 2019 will mark 15 years of profitability for the for, for the surety industry, which is pretty much unheard of. Um, uh, pro uh, and of course, the profitability, like any any business or line of business, uh, when, a, when, a, when a line is profitable, it attracts capital. And we've seen that in the surety line of business, be it brand new entrants into the market um, or uh, or companies that played in a certain level, maybe a company that had been used to supporting a, a small to mid-sized contractors now uh, has increased its capacity because senior management of the insurance companies, which sureties are a part of, look at the line of business, the amount of profit that's being generated and say, hey, we want more of that good stuff. Um, and, and on top of that, um, 
you know, the surety industry, just like the insurance industry, is supported by reinsurers um, who, you know, the, the surety will off, offload some of their risk on each bond to a reinsurance to soften, uh, soften results and to protect in the event of a catastrophic event. And the reinsurers have been making money and it's been a very, very soft environment. Although um, in terms of, of signs moving forward um, for the past six to seven years every year reinsurance treaties with insurance companies have been decreasing in price and getting more um, flexible in terms of terms uh, terms and um, our connections tell us that this current cycle uh, renewals were flat they did not decrease so th th that could signify uh, changes uh, for things to come and we'll, we'll, we'll see and we're on top of that um, the competition, um, and this is great for the, all the contractors listening, uh, the competition for quality contractors is absolutely intense um, from, amongst sureties to compete with, with good business. We don't see a lot of good business moving around, but boy, when it does, it's a feeding frenzy. Um, and and, and, and that, that's indicative of how soft the market is and how profitable the surety line has been. Um, but like I said earlier, th there are some warning signs uh, that, that we're really keeping an eye on. This slide shows the surety results. There's a, this, this is a tribute to the Surety and Fidelity Association of America. All sureties uh, report their results to this uh, this association, the industry association, and, and so there's some clarity and transparency around the results for the industry. Um, and, and as you can see here, the, the, the green line represents the loss ratio for the industry on an aggregate basis. Uh, the blue line represents premium and the red line is actual paid losses. Um, keeping in mind that in the loss, there are some reserves in the loss, so there's the, loss, the, the results probably are a little bit better than, than represented here, but um, as you can see, um, the, the, the premium since 2012 has been increasing. It's now, Surety's now a six and a half billion dollar business, which, which sounds large, but it's really 1% of the overall property and casualty market, which is, Pretty traditionally, th th been that percentage uh, in terms of breakdown. The the just of note, 2005. You, you see the the loss ratio was very high and it, it came down. Uh, that that uh, that year that was still profitable. On average, a surety company um, has a has a, the uh, a expense expense ratio somewhere around 40 to 45 percent. So if you take their expenses. And the loss ratio, any anything anything over 55 to 60 percent loss ratio, and the surety industry is losing money, and they were making money. But prior prior to 2005, from 2001 to 2004, the industry lost in excess of 10 billion dollars, with uh, a number of sizable contract uh, construction losses. Uh, and uh, and also there was a kind of an anomaly in terms of uh, events like WorldCom uh, of um, Enron that also hit the surety industry. So it was a, a, some lots of blood in the water back then. Market, I don't know for those of you who have lived it, the market surety market got very tight and capacity was was at a premium and, and rates rose and all the things you'd expect from a hard market. But since then, um, the market has been very very profitable, very consistent, and and. You know, the the kind of the one of the things too, and what what led to the last hard market was uh, coming out of the recession of 2001. Uh, the economy spiked, and typically that's when we see uh, surety losses. Is when co uh, contractors take on lots of work and and kind of choke on the volume. And you'll see you'll you'll see a slight spike from 2011 to 2012. But, but not that bad and certainly still very profitable. And that's really indicative of the fact that this, although we're enjoying such a long uh, a growth cycle uh, in the U.S., it, it never it never was it never was incrementally uh, spiked. It, it, the, the, the growth was was slow and steady and it and it really it played well because folks didn't overextend uh, in terms of resources. Um, the one negative about that whole period was and I think we, we were seeing this now is you know there was there was an outflux of talent from the construction industry uh, that, that and they've never come back folks have never come back either they've retired or they've moved on to different industries and, and we've seen that impact uh, in the way of skilled labor uh, shortages and so the the the, the year-end results for 2019 for surety are not in yet but nine months are and and losses are up um, we've seen uh, both in terms of frequency 
and in, in terms of severity um, compared to a year ago where uh, this year it's almost 17 percent loss ratio last year was 15 percent uh, year over year in September again nothing that's going to make the industry unprofitable but a trend we're keeping our eye on because we're just we're seeing uh, lots of little things. We're seeing more losses. Um, you know, surety losses paid out are $830 million through nine months. Um, that would tell us that this will be a this this will be a a, a less profitable year for the industry than last year. Um, and again, uh, the cost to rectify a problem right now, and if you think about it, it makes it makes all the sense in the world. Everyone's working at kind of full capacity, not a lot of resources. So when a surety has to complete a work for a defaulted contractor. Um, it's harder to get someone to come in and do that. And if they do, they're gonna do it at a, at a, at a, a, a real premium in terms of uh, what they're, they're willing to uh, take in terms of cost to, fi to fix the problem for the surety. Um, the sureties uh, are seeing, uh, let me back up a little bit. Typically, and, and it, it, ultimately it's always a, a financial issue that creates a surety loss. But this, this current, uptick in, in claim activity is really a lot more attributable to schedule and manpower related losses versus a financial insolvency. Uh, ultimately, it drives financial insolvency, but it, it's not it's not predicated in that to begin with. And, and as, a, as a backdrop, we, uh, our firm also uh, participates. Uh, we, we're a large uh, writer of subcontractor default insurance. And for those that don't know it at a real high level, it, it's basically a general contractor will implement a, uh, an insurance policy to protect uh, against defaults of subcontractors. And we're seeing the same things there. Um, we're, we're seeing um, we're seeing loss, losses tick up. Um, although I tell you that the, the firms are just a little bit better at kind of doing their pre-qual work, um, being a little bit more selective about who they uh, who they subcontract to on a various uh, given job. Um, it, it, interesting to note, and it, it, this this s stood out to me, and I thought maybe it'd be int of interest to you. Um, recent data shows that you know you think you think about a, a viable contractor that's going along, no issues. Um, over 50% of the surety defaults that a surety sees are attributable to one catastrophic job. So, like I said, it just takes one mistake to, to bring the whole the whole house down, and it's something to be really mindful of. We see it all the time. Um, and, and, and with that as kind of a backdrop, what we're seeing, and this is a little counterintuitive to me, um, is that even even though contractors are busy, backlogs are up margins are up owners are uh, owners have been able to continue to shift more risk down onto the contractors uh, in terms of contractual risk um, and and the and the general contractors will push this down to the sub so that it, it's just fraught with with more risk and some of it um, is tough to quantify and if it's tough to quantify it's tough it's tough to mitigate and or price um, and we're talking about things like excessive design risk Unforeseen site conditions, which in the, the contracts are typically, you know, usually unforeseen site conditions. You'd you'd get relief in your contract. We're seeing contracts where you get no relief. It's you own it, no matter what it is. Um, and, and same thing with consen uh, consequential or actual damages. Those, and from a surety perspective, it's very difficult to quantify a consequential or actual damage. And there's a, a much more of a preference to at least have liquidated damages where you know what they are. Uh, ideally, they're capped. And so you can you can kind of price that into the to the project when you when you estimate it. Um, and then there's the financial risk. And that, and that can be anything from the more exotic P3 projects where, where the contractor is asked to take kind of a bite and, and has some if there's if they don't deliver the, the penalties for not delivering a, a project on schedule. Um, Really equate to the interest rate for the for the loan that the developer is charging, which is again a tough tough risk to, to undertake. We're also seeing contracts that push undue risk in terms of um, payment terms, and we've we've seen that impact. We've seen sureties have to step in and, and finance otherwise healthy contractors because of the cash flow implications of a of a large hung receivable. Um, the, the other thing, and I, I think anyone that's read a, a, an industry publication in terms of trends uh, has seen announcements from various, and these are all public, um, from an AECOM, a Granite, a, a Scanska, a Floor, and they're all announcing that they're no longer pursuing quote unquote mega projects. Um, and, and really when we're talking about mega projects and, and typically they're design build or, or more design build, operate finance, maintain, um, and these are over a billion dollars and, and the, the 
the results for these firms, obviously, because they're getting out, have been very, very poor. Um, and some of them are well documented. And some of the, some of them, um, if you dig through the notes of some of these publicly traded uh, construction companies, you, you'll you'll see you'll see them attributable to contractors. I think it's a, it's it's not so much of a secret. The the Tappan Zee Bridge in New York, um, there's some real issues there, creating some um, consternation on the part of the, the the consortium of contractors that are trying to finish that out and get paid uh, from the uh, from New York. I think there's been some lawsuits. So we're we're seeing a lot of that, and it's going to be interesting to see where that segment of the marketplace goes. And, and what I mean by that is, you know, we're, we're seeing talk about P3s, which are typically, and we've seen here in here in Pennsylvania, it was an $800 million P3 to build roughly 800 bridges across the state, big project. Um, so we're seeing a move towards projects like that, yet we're seeing some of the largest firms in the country saying, we're not building those anymore. And so where does that go? Currently, and my fear is we're, we're seeing um, so there's an influx of, of foreign contractors that are very used to that that um, that delivery model and seem to be comfortable with the risk. Although I, I would argue that um, the, that risk in Europe is very different than that risk in the U.S., where you know you know we have uh, you know more lawyers per capita than any other country, and, and, and we're seeing that played out. Um, and, and finally, you know we're, we're you know. We've kidded around a little bit about it, but things like 606, um, you know, we, you know, it, it, it's something that needs to be understood. And thankfully, most of the time, it's there's there hasn't been any material changes. Um, but but again, um, you know, we've we've had contractors talk about gap, non-gap, and um, you know, depending on the situation, you know, I think we always have a bias towards a gap financial statement, and our folks, our friends here, can chime in on that or, or not. But um, but it, it still would take some uh, some um, discussion with your surety and your bank to, to make sure that they're comfortable with that. And I guess the next quote unquote shoe to drop will be understanding the the new lease uh, accounting standards. Um, so th th those are some of the things that we're kind of tracking as we move forward. So ultimately, kind of, kind of, kind of, best in class, kind of wrap this piece of it up. It's, it's, we're really seeing the, the best contractors are really good about taking on contractual risk and passing on risk they can identify, mitigate or price. Um, and, and and also, and I and I think either Mike or Dan touched on this before, but you know, things are good, and and so maybe managing costs aren't quite as important, but 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 things will go bad and it's always important to manage your your, your costs and, and and be prudent with that for then be prepared for the next downturn um you know again approach volume with uh, uh, the context of your organizational capacity don't overreach um be disciplined about your go or no go process and don't sway from it, especially when your backlog is solid to begin with um and, and i guess I'm, i want to give you folks some time for questions so uh, I, you can you can read this but i'll, I'll wrap it up there and, and pass it off to mike Great. Thanks, Gary. Um, I guess we answered all the questions because none of our audience actually posed anything. Um, and I will say uh, in context of that, though, I would invite you, our contact information's on the screen. Uh, I would invite you to please reach out if there are any specific questions uh, based on what you heard today. Uh, I think given the, the time, I will not get into my various thoughts on how the leasing standard is going to maybe change the way we view financial statements. Um, that's a topic for another for another webinar. But thank you, Gary, for joining us today. Thank you, Dan, for your insight. And thank you to each of you that uh, has been listening in for the last hour. We appreciate your attentiveness. We appreciate your interest. Uh, and I would offer if there is anything that either Construction Risk Partners or McConley and Asbury could do to assist you in achieving your objectives, you please reach out and give us a call. Thank you once again for joining us for this webinar recap produced by McConley and Asbury. We hope you join us for our future webinars. You can stay connected to us and learn more about all of our upcoming events by visiting us online at macpas.com. Thanks again and have a great day.